400 million years ago, this was a cauldron of exploding volcanoes and molten lava. A few million years later, a shallow tropical sea appeared and laid down this bed of limestone. None of which would really matter to anyone today, except for the fact that this is Flodden Field, the site of one of the bloodiest battles in British history. But how did a volcanic eruption 400 million years ago help defeat one of the strongest armies ever to invade England? And why did the formation of the Ardennes Mountains in Belgium cause the death of the King of Scotland and change the course of British history? In this series, we're going to look at how environments far back in time, millions of years before humans appeared on Earth, affected the outcome of battles and changed human history. The type of rock an army found itself fighting on was sometimes a matter of design, but often it was pure chance. And if the right type of environment had laid down the right type of rock, it gave the underdog an unwitting victory. The underdog at the Battle of Flodden 500 years ago was Henry VIII's army of around 26,000 men. Henry himself wasn't even there. He was off fighting in France, and he left the elderly Earl of Surrey in charge of what remained of his forces in England, with strict instructions not to trust the Scots. His potential adversary was James IV, a Renaissance king with a keen interest in science and culture and an old-fashioned spirit of chivalry. A powerful ruler, James had united Scotland, founded its navy, encouraged the first printing press, and brought culture and prestige to the nation. He even married Henry VIII's sister and signed a perpetual treaty of peace with England. But when France came under attack, James felt honour bound to strike a blow for the old Scottish-French alliance. He assembled an army of over 30,000 men and crossed the border here at the River Tweed. The Scots sacked Norham Castle, the English fortress that overlooks the river. As they marched south, other castles fell with barely a fight. Then James came up against two things. One was Henry VIII's home army. The second was some serious Devonian geology. The Devonian was a period so far back in time you can forget humans. Oh, it was way back before the dinosaurs, and even the animals that evolved into dinosaurs. During the Devonian, around 400 million years ago, there were no land animals at all. And that wasn't the only thing that was different about the Devonian period. The geography of the continents was unrecognisable. Europe was in the tropics. It moves because the pieces of the Earth's crust are in constant motion, floating on the Earth's upper mantle. Plates of basalt, which make up the ocean, submerge under thicker plates made of granite, which are the continents. As they do so, they melt, creating chains of volcanoes. But when pieces of continent collide, they can't submerge. Instead, they crumple into huge mountain ranges and eventually fuse together. For billions of years, these pieces of crust have been splitting apart, drifting around and colliding. By the beginning of the Devonian, two of these plates, Eurasia and North America, had crashed together. As they pushed against each other, they threw up the Caledonian Mountains and forged Scotland. Further south, in the Cheviot Hills, the grinding of the crustal plates caused enormous friction. Rocks at the base of the crust melted and pushed their way through fissures to the surface. There they exploded in a cauldron of ash, gas and molten lava. And this is the result, a thick layer of volcanic material heaped onto the barren earth. 
Look at it closely and you can see it's a mixture of ash, rock fragments and other volcanic debris. Sandwiched between layers of lava, geologists estimate this volcanic material was once two kilometers thick. Towering volcanic peaks dominated the landscape. So 400 million years ago, this was an enormous mountain range. But wind, rain, sun and ice have worn the mountains down, and as we travel northeast, the peaks get smaller and lower. Their last gasp is an outlying lump called Flodden Hill. It's covered in woodland today, but in 1513 this was an exposed volcanic outcrop, and when King James saw it, he immediately realized its potential. The steep scarps facing south would be like a fortress against the advancing English army. He dug gun emplacements into the side of the hill and waited. This outcrop on the side of Flodden Hill shows exactly what it's made of, a lava called andesite which flowed out of a volcano and then solidified into this solid mass. But the sheer sides of this volcanic outlier proved to be a little too impregnable. The Earl of Surrey quite sensibly decided he didn't want to attack it. So he came up with a risky plan. Surrey would lead his army right around Flodden Hill and face the Scots from the other side. Out of sight, he embarked on a two-day forced march. His exhausted and bedraggled army finally reached its objective at about four o'clock in the afternoon of the 9th of September. The vanguard of Surrey's army broke cover here, about a mile and a half north of Flodden Hill. James now realized that the English army was behind him. His supply lines from Scotland had been cut and his line of retreat blocked. He had no choice but to come down from his natural fortress. He moved his army to the piece of high ground opposite called Brankston Hill. But what neither he nor Surrey understood was that each was occupying a completely different type of slope. While the Scots were still on the andesite, the volcanic rock, the English had set up on a piece of limestone called cement stone. And that was to make all the difference. To understand where these cement stone rocks came from, we need to fast forward 50 million years from when those volcanoes were exploding. The Earth looks very different. We're in the Carboniferous, the next geological period after the Devonian, and a lot has changed. After the volcanic eruptions stopped, the Cheviot Mountains began to erode. Then, at the beginning of the Carboniferous, sea levels rose, cutting them off. Being on the edge of this mountain range, Flodden Hill would have been right on the coastline, the tropical waters lapping up against it. It would have looked something like this, not exactly how we think of Northumberland. Tons of sediment were deposited at the bottom of these shallow seas, silt and sand washed out from rivers, the crushed shells of tiny marine animals mixed with mud, the detritus piled up over millions of years. When the sea finally retreated at the end of the Carboniferous, it left a thick layer of this material behind, collectively known as the cement stone group. This is an outcrop not far from the battlefield. You can see that the cement stone has hardened into this concrete-like rock, but it's weathered into a very permeable material. The water drains away very freely. In contrast to the impermeable andesite, rainwater drains easily from the cement stone group. It gushes through cracks in the limestone. It filters into and between the layers of sandstone. So these were the bedrocks on which our two armies now squared up. The English troops exhausted after a long forced march. The Scottish soldiers were rested and eager and had a commanding position on the volcanic slopes of Brankston Hill. They also had the unbeatable weapon of the age, the Swiss pike. Um, the pike was 15, 16 feet long. And you can imagine, a bit like a porcupine, lots of them together made a formidable weapon. The medieval version of the tank, with, say, a, a front of a hundred of these pikes moving forward at a steady pace, they were absolutely unstoppable and, and devastating.
After an artillery exchange, the battle opened on the left flank, with formations of Scottish pikemen advancing across flat ground to the west of Brankston Hill, towards Sir Edmund Howard and his 4,000 English foot soldiers. The English were armed with the much smaller bill, a double-bladed weapon with a hook. But the landscape easily favoured the pike. In this open country, the Scots charged into the English lines and scattered them. If this success could be repeated with the other two pike battalions, the Scots would easily have carried the day. But on the rest of the battlefield, the geology was different. James IV didn't know it, but the volcanic andesite under his feet was going to be a problem. And it was compounded by another geological event he was equally, blissfully unaware of. To understand it, we have to fast forward through the Carboniferous, through the age of the dinosaurs, through the tertiary period, almost right up to the present day in geological terms. Through all this, the continent of Europe was pushed northwards by crustal plate movement. Britain left the tropics and migrated to its current position. Now in its colder, more northerly latitude, it was hit head-on by the Ice Age. 15,000 years ago, all this was buried under an ice sheet one mile thick. That's just recently in geological terms, which means that the ice has left its mark. If you've got an eye for these things, the hills and valleys here are full of glacial clues and features. A huge ice sheet crept down from Scotland, hit the Cheviot Hills and deflected to the east. The moving ice carried particles of eroded material in the form of sand and gravel and churned up the underlying rock into a fine clay. As the Ice Age ended, it melted, depositing this material on the landscape. And though neither side could see it, the ice had left its fatal mark on the battlefield. Each slope had been coated with a different glacial material. So the English began to draw up their formations on the well-drained cement stone. The Scots marched towards them, on top of the impermeable volcanic andesite. The retreating glaciers had gifted the English well-drained deposits of sand and gravel. For the Scots, it had dumped a mucky, thick coating of clay called till. On the 9th of September, 1513, it began to rain. This had little effect on the English, who stood firm on the cement stone, which carried the water away. But here on the Scottish side, the volcanic bedrock trapped water in the coating of glacial clay. While the battalions of pikes had done well on the left flank, here in the muddy slopes of the centre and the right, the Scots began to slip and stumble. Slowly they began to break formation. By the time they reached the bottom of the slope, their lines were already faltering. And now they met the next obstacle, and this is where a mountain building event in Europe millions of years ago was to seal their fate. Throughout the Devonian and Carboniferous periods, a series of collisions between crustal plates was throwing up mountain chains all over Europe. Called the Hercynian Orogeny, it formed the Ardennes in Belgium and the Massif Central in France. It was an event that took place over hundreds of millions of years, and even today geologists are still trying to make sense of it. But one thing they do know is that this upheaval caused rocks in outlying areas to crack. The cracks, called faults, run for several miles, and half a dozen can be found in the Cheviot Hills. Each fault was heralded by an earthquake. And this is Flodden Fault, running right through the middle of the battlefield. It separated the Scots from the English. A series of earthquakes thrust up these andesites and pushed them hard up against the cement stone. And it was this fault line that was to seal the fate of the Scottish battalions. This big fault system which, which, which juxtaposes the younger cement stones of the Carboniferous against the Devonian um, against the Devonian volcanics, that has moved the rocks on either side into that position such that subsequently when they've weathered and eroded you've now got this great to topographic difference. The topographic difference washed tons of eroded material into the newly created gash in the earth forming a deep boggy sump. 
the charge of the Scottish pike formations, already disrupted by the wet clay till and the badly drained andesite slope, hit the sticky bog of the fault line and began to break apart. The pikes, unstoppable, formidable, whilst they're in motion. Unfortunately for the Scots, on the, steep, uh, the valley at the steeper part of Branksome Hill, suddenly the front ranks were knee-deep in mud, which slowed them down. The ranks behind piled on top of them, complete confusion, and, and as they were no longer moving, they were suddenly a target. Then the English bills had a go. It has a point for, for stabbing and jabbing. It has, this one has another point for hacking into armor, into a helmet. And it also has this deadly hook for grabbing the back of the knee or eye-wateringly up and under. It also has this axe type blade here. This is a fearsome weapon. From what had seemed almost certain victory, the Scots were now, incredibly, facing likely defeat. Their only hope was a battalion of Highlanders held in reserve on the right flank. But a Highland charge was stopped in its tracks by a breakaway detachment of English archers. The Highlanders, thinking they'd been outflanked by a much larger contingent of Surrey's army, broke off their charge and fled. James was now desperately fighting on foot alongside his men their ranks broken, their weapons useless, and surrounded on all sides. An arrow was shot through his mouth, and then an unknown English soldier sliced his throat with a bill. James died along with his son, eight earls and 13 barons. The cream of Scottish nobility, a generation of leaders, was wiped out. Every year on the anniversary of the battle, a commemoration takes place at the Flodden Monument, overlooking the battle site. This is very much a Scottish affair. While in England the Battle of Flodden is largely forgotten, for the Scots it's a significant and wrenching piece of history. What could have been a golden age of Scottish Renaissance ended abruptly and catastrophically. Before the Battle of Flodden, Scotland was uh, a very prosperous nation. Uh, uh, James IV uh, founded universities, uh, he looked after his people and he was the most popular king Scotland ever had and then it all finished here because, and then within a hundred years Scotland was united with England, the crowns were united. Battles are rarely decided by one factor alone. If James had been less impetuous, if the Highlanders had charged earlier, the Scots might have carried the day. But the early Scottish success on the left flank showed that what ultimately defeated them were geological events they never even knew had happened. The events three or four hundred million years ago have dictated the nature of the, of the lithology, the rocks beneath our feet at that particular point. Uh, and also, not just the, the uh, depositional uh, and environmental effects of that time, but the subsequent earth movements. Geology sleeps underground. It only gets our attention when new disasters hit the headlines, earthquakes, landslides, tsunami. But events that occurred far back in time are just disasters lying in wait. A volcanic eruption that no one saw, an earthquake no one felt, an ice sheet that came and went while our ancestors were still migrating out of Africa. All these events have been waiting for their date with history.